Marriage 101. Tips for singles. Bosses and their staff go through stress because of broken relationships. And people who plan to get married many times don't make it to the altar because of broken relationships. And then there are those who do get married and they end up in divorce and that is trauma broken relationships then there are those who are planning to marry again after divorce relationship problems what a struggle then there are those who are married and they seem to be doing well they're the ones I'm especially concerned about because they don't tell the truth most of the time. They parade a good face. They pretend and all the while they are going through silent hell. I would rather be single and frustrated than married and frustrated. Matter of fact, I am convinced that the loneliest people in the world are not unmarried people. The loneliest people in the world are married people who are trapped in a marriage that's not working. At least if you're lonely and you're not married, got to fill these seats please sir. At least if you're lonely and not married, you could at least go be friends with somebody and go out with somebody and have some ice cream. But when you're married and it ain't working, you can't go and have ice cream with nobody. It's, it's hell on earth. As a matter of fact, it's more important for you to not be married than to be married and wish you weren't. Don't marry a person because you think you love them or they say they love you wrong reason love does not make marriage successful now your grandmother and your grandfather stayed together but it wasn't because of love it was because of the culture at that time that we call respectful dependency She depended on him for her livelihood because 50 years ago women were not working outside the home and so it was very very understandable for a woman to remain with a man no matter how he treated her and some of you got stories that you can tell me about your grandmother putting up with so much and never leaving not because she didn't want to leave, believe me, but because of the socio-economic cultural environment, it was to her benefit to stay in spite of. He also depended on her because he was not ready to bring up the children by himself. And he was not going to clean up no house. So he depended on her, she depended on him, and therefore, the unity was based on mutual respect and dependency, not love. However, that has changed now, hasn't it? Because now women are out working the same hours you're working. Which means when they come home tired, you're tired, and they're tired now. And so, your grandfather used to meet the food on the table. But things change now. Ain't no food on the table, not unless you get Kentucky on the way back home. <laughs> Having a warm bath run for you and your newspaper on the chair with your bedroom slippers waiting at the, at the lazy boy chair, them days are over. It's a different world. And what's even more challenging is the relationship is no longer dependent on dependency. Because he could leave you now and put the kids up for adoption. Or he could keep them and let a daycare center bring them up. 
she could leave now and still keep us standard of living because she probably making more money than you anyhow. Matter of fact, when you met her, she had a car already and perhaps a house and some real estate. See, things have changed. So don't get this idea that relationships work because of love. Now, love is important, and you got all kinds of definitions of love. We're going to deal with that later on in about two weeks. But, but this is important to understand that, that love does not make a successful relationship, especially when you talk about marriage. And so I want to clarify some things. Uh, I want to begin tonight with a scripture that I call it the pivot of Jesus' discussion on singleness, marriage, and divorce. In one chapter, he dealt with all three of them. He dealt with singleness, he dealt with marriage, and he dealt with divorce in one chapter. Turn your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of Matthew, chapter 19. Matthew, chapter 19. I keep referring back to this because I believe it is the New Testament's charter on relationships. This passage is loaded with Jesus' secret wisdom on male-female relationships. Women get along fine with women, and men get along fine with men. But when a woman and a man get together, the potential for conflict goes up by 98%. Because nothing is as complicated as a male and a female. Now it seems like the female is a little bit more complicated than the male. I used to think so. I did my research and read a lot of books, studied a lot of journals, went to a lot of seminars, and I've come to the conclusion that that is not true. They are both equally complicated. They are very different, but they are complicated. God made them that way. But complication is an opinion. Because complication gets its definition from ignorance. Say la. Something is only, only complicated if you are ignorant about it. Am I right? If you know how to cook grits, it ain't complicated. If you know how to make baked macaroni with cheese, it's not complicated. It's easy for you. But for someone who doesn't know how to do it, it's complicated. So a male is really not complicated. And a female is not complicated. The problem is you are ignorant. Wherever there is ignorance, there is experimentation. So when we don't know something, we experiment with it. That means we keep taking these different tests. We keep testing it to see what works or what doesn't work, what might work, what might not work. That's called an experiment. Because we don't know how and what the results are. Here we find Jesus being approached by some very educated religious leaders in Matthew 19. And these are actually professors of the law, referring to the law of Moses, which governed the lives of the people at the time. And it also governed their social relationships. Uh, Moses laid down the law. It was not a religious law that Moses created. This is important. It was a law for national development. So the laws that Moses laid down were for a nation, not for a religion. God gave Moses tremendous wisdom from above as to how people are to live together within the context of a social development, a society. How they are to live and then marry and then remain married. 
God gave Moses all of these wonderful principles. And here we find in this chapter 19 of Matthew, those who claim to have been experts in that law asking a question to the one who wrote the law. Let's read what they say. Verse 3. Some of the Pharisees, that's the law, lawyers, came to him to test him. And they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They addressed him with a problem of divorce. To understand the context of this verse, you have to learn a little bit of hermeneutics. You must go back and study the history and the environment and the culture. Uh, this event is taking place 400 years after Malachi dies. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi was the last prophet that God spoke to regarding the coming of the Messiah. And Malachi also introduces John the Baptist in his last chapter. In Malachi, that considers now 400 years before this event here in Matthew, Malachi was alive. In the time of Malachi, the number one epidemic in society was divorce. As a matter of fact, some of you are looking at me funny, so let's just take a look at this. I sometimes I say things, I forget that, you know, you might not know what I know. Turn to Malachi. Go back to the last book in the Old Testament. Very interesting. Chapter 2 of Malachi. I want to show you how horrible it was. As a matter of fact, during the time of Malachi... A man could divorce his wife for some of the most silliest reasons you could dream of. For example, if a man married a woman and she burned the food while cooking, he would divorce her. It was that bad. If a woman went to bed with her husband and he approached her for intercourse, and she did not advise him that she was in her menstruation period. He divorced her. It was dumb. It was so bad. A woman could get a divorce during the time of Malachi if a man was having a meal with his friends, men friends, and she came in and stayed too long in the room. It was silly. But it was real. So we find God prophesying through Malachi against this attitude of this destruction of marriages. I won't read the whole thing, but I want you to just get the spirit of it. Look at verse 13. God is prophesying through Malachi. He says, Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears, you weep and you wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands? You ask, why? Doesn't the Lord hear my prayer or receive my offerings? You know, you're complaining, why don't God answer my prayers? Why am I not getting any more miracles from God or whatever? He says, you ask, why? And he answers, it is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Underline that. In other words, God was at your wedding. You thought it was only the bridesmaid and the groomsmen that was witnesses. He said, but I was there. And I witnessed you telling this woman, you will love her and her only until you die. And I heard you tell this man, you will submit to him and be a wife to him until you die. He says, I was present and I was taking notes. Read the next statement. But you have broken faith with her your prayer depends on your vows ah. B 
before you get married, remember now, you are not married now, think. Your prayers are getting answered easier. When you get married, the person you married could mess up your prayer life. The Bible says, if a husband and a wife are together, First Peter says this, he says, if you are angry with your spouse, God will not hear your prayer. So you ain't married now, your prayers can be answered easily. Remember when you are marrying someone, you are marrying a potential prayer hinderer. <laughs> Serious business. Because if you are mad with your wife, you cannot go in the next room and pray. Impossible. Because the scripture says, when you come before God to offer your prayers, and you know that someone has ought against you, it says, don't even offer your prayer. Go back in the next room. Make it right with them first. See? Now, right now, you ain't married, so you don't want to go in the next room too to make it right first. All the married people smiling at me. They ain't saying if they're smiling. They know what I'm talking about. This is heavy stuff here. He said, that's why I don't listen to your prayer. Watch this. He says, even though she is your partner. Underline that. She ain't your domestic servant. I am reading Old Testament here. He says, your wife is your partner. Not your slave to wash dishes and iron shirts and cook food. She is your partner 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 means equal in status equal in contribution equal in value equal in worth equal in substance she's your partner she ain't your old lady She's your partner. Look at the last part. And she is the wife of your what? Marriage covenant. He says, you break faith with that. Verse 15, he tells us why he married you. Now this is important here. Because when we read uh, Matthew again, you're going to see... He connects us to this statement. He says, Has not the Lord made them one? Who made them one? See, God was at your wedding. Or if you get married, remember, you don't need to send an invitation to God. He shows up. If you claim He is your Lord, then He has a right to show up at the wedding and he said he is the Lord and he made you one in flesh that's important uh, Genesis chapter chapter 1 and chapter 2 talks about male and female and in chapter 2 it says for this cause should a man leave his what mother and father and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become what one flesh now in Malachi he's repeating it he says I made you two in flesh very important and spirit keep reading because you are mine says the Lord let me tell you something marriage is not about you I want you to think about this. If you, if you are married, God don't consider you married for you. You are married for Him. God will give you a wife because of something He wants from you. Can I prove it? Let's read it. He says, I made you one in flesh and spirit. You are mine. 
And why? He asked God saying now, let me he said, You want to know why? He answers it. He says, Because I was seeking godly seed. You know why people get divorced? Because they got married. If God married you, you cannot get a divorce. Why? It's not about you or how you feel. Matter of fact, God really ain't interested in you in marriage. What's he interested in? Read it. Righteous seed. Righteous seed. The reason why God created marriage is to guarantee his future. Your children are more important to God than your feelings toward your husband. You know, I used to read the scripture in 1 Corinthians, and it made me angry, uh, chapter 7. Uh, it says, if you live with an ungodly person, stay with them. <laughs> he said, no matter how they behave, stay with them. And it tells you why. It says, so that the children might be sanctified. You see, it's not about you. What we've done is we've made marriage about us. Whether am I happy? Am I satisfied? Am I comfortable? Do I still love him? Do I still love her? Do I still want to put up with this person? Do I like their personality? Do they? Do I like what I found out? I, I, I. It ain't about you. You know why God loved Abraham? I figured it out years ago. I was about 18 years old when I figured out the revelation about Abraham. God says, Abraham, this is found in uh, Genesis chapter 18. He said, let me tell you something. He said, the reason why I love you and I will tell you secrets is because you will teach your children and your servants the commandments of the Lord. In other words, you are going to make your offspring righteous. I'm going to be your God. Uh, this is a little secret, but I don't, don't get nervous about this, okay? But let me tell you something. The more righteous you are, if you're not careful, you'll have plenty of children. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Now, the reason is because God wants righteous seed. So when you become a more righteous man, a more righteous woman, God begins to find a womb that guarantees the potential of righteous seed. Read the next part. It gets worse. He says, so guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Do not divorce her. Why? It's not about you. If you want to have children as a married couple and you have a little child challenges, you know what to do? Use this verse and go back and pray. Put it on God. All right, God, I am now ready to produce righteous children. I am available. You will conceive. Because this gives you a kingdom promise. Now verse 16, read out loud, please. I hate divorce, says the Lord. There's that verse. You always wanted to find it. There it is. Do you see why God hates divorce? 
because you are meddling with his program for the future. God's future is in children. And when you disrupt the functioning of those children's incubation within marriage, you are meddling with the success of his program for the future. That's why you must stay married. This time it has to work. It ain't about you. God said, don't even, don't even mention the word divorce to me. You know, God is love. But boy, when love tells you it hates something, gosh, that must be terrible to that love. There's a deep reason why he hates it. And now you know why. Because the only hope God has for the future of the world is planting the seeds in the children. And when you disrupt that, you are interfering with his will and his purpose in the earth. That's why God really calls a homosexuality an abomination because it disrupts the program. So don't get involved in all the other discussions about it. It's this disruption. He hates that also because it disrupts the program. There's no way that God ever planned for two men to bring up a child it, it, it cannot work. The child will come out imbalanced and temporarily insane and perhaps permanently damaged psychologically. Because God's program is for the unique, inherent female idiosyncrasies to contribute to the development of a child and for the strange uniqueness of a male to contribute to the development of that child so that child comes out balanced. Can't happen with two women. I hate divorce, says the Lord. The God of Israel, verse 16, read it. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garments, says the Lord Almighty. I hate divorce and I hate a man trying to cover up the reason why he should do it. You know, we always got this way. Well, you know... Uh, I don't love her anymore. God, what are you talking about? Covenants have no feelings. When you sign a contract, there is no feeling in that paper. I don't love him anymore. God says, so what? You're trying to cover up your selfish desire to be free again by this vain leap explanation. He says, go back and consider why I married you in the first place. Children's sake. 